Cornwall is so famous for its coast that its rivers and streams can be forgotten. But when you look at a map, you get an idea of just how much fresh water is in our landscape. We all need water to survive, so it's probably time we started taking a much closer look at what's happening to it. My name's Rupert Kirkwood and this is my climate story. I'm a retired vet and I've always had a passion for the great British countryside and its fantastic wildlife. I also love kayaking and I've actually paddled every inch of the Cornish coastline, including going up every creek, estuary and river as far as I can go at high tide. Talking of which, the tide's coming in now, so it gives me an opportunity to go and explore the upper reaches of the Tamar Valley. With climate change making our rainfall much more unpredictable, I want to find out what the future will hold for our rivers and wildlife, the water we need to drink and grow our crops, and the safety of our homes. Even if climate change wasn't happening, we would have a problem with our landscape not holding water. But climate change is just going to make that 10 times worse. I just came up the path and just filled the house like a goldfish bowl. They can provide us with so much, as well as the rest of nature with so much. I personally feel like I'm doing something for this generation, but also for, for the next generation. When you're gliding along quietly on a kayak, wild animals don't see you as a threat, and I've been lucky enough to have had some really remarkable encounters. Last spring, I was excited to watch kingfishers building their burrow nests right here on the River Tamar but after a bone dry spring, these were very sadly flooded out by the absolutely torrential rains in May. I also managed to film these fantastic Bartel gobwits in Foy. They have the longest non-stop migration of any bird on earth, and like thousands of other birds, they stop off to feed on Cornish river estuary mudflats. But what will happen to them as rising water levels put the squeeze on these vital feeding grounds? Many other people are concerned about the threats to life in Cornwall's rivers too and some are taking matters into their own hands. This is the St Austell River, but locals call it the White River because it did used to run white, like emulsion paint, because the China clay companies used to use the rivers to transport clay from one place to another. You always look at a stream and think, oh, there's nothing in there, but actually when you start digging around and collecting things, you find there's a hell of a lot. We do what's called kick sampling. You kick the bed of the stream and then the little creatures flow into the net and get trapped. What we're specifically looking for are stonefly larva, mayfly larva, small creatures like that, caddisfly larva, and we count them and then the overall score tells you how clean the river is. The funding for the Environment Agency have been slashed by over 50% in the last 10, 15 years. They really just don't have the manpower or the money to do this kind of monitoring. They used to do it routinely. Points on the St Ossel River have not been monitored since the late 1990s. Basically, nobody's looking at the river. So without any information, no one will see what's there and then you've got no data to base anything on. Around Cornwall, the numbers of river flies have been decreasing. They are at the bottom of the food chain. If you take out the bottom of the food chain, eventually the river becomes dead. 76% of Cornish rivers are now classed as being in poor environmental condition, and Nick and Lucy have found one very obvious source of pollution in their river. We noticed there was a lot of grey, horrible sort of filmy sort of stuff on the, all the edges of the river. So we came up further upstream, realised it was a sewage outfall. So I reported it to the Environment Agency and it turns out that in 2019 and also in 2020, the number of hours it was running was equivalent to 24 hours a day for four months. None of this has been treated, so the bacteria and stuff are coming out. They clog up the vegetation on the side and this stuff called sewage fungus grows, which is this grey, horrible stuff above the outfall and below the outfall, the situation changes quite radically. So up here we will still find some of the mayfly larvae that live in clean water. On the other side of the outfall they all disappear. You gain species like freshwater shrimp, leeches, things that can live in dirty water. And what goes into our rivers doesn't stay in our rivers. I'm sure I'm not the only one to remember the joys of dodging raw sewage while in the sea at Cornish beaches many years ago. But isn't this supposed to be a thing of the past? 
surfer Jack Smith has learnt the hard way to make sure the water is safe before getting in. I've been surfing 16 years now. Started surfing at this beach here, just escaping life. While you're out there, you don't really think of anything else. Being surrounded by nature is pretty, pretty good. Sometimes the water isn't crystal clear blue. It can be quite brown and not very nice. When you're paddling out and you, you can actually smell like that it's not very natural what's coming out, you just try and not ingest any water, basically, and <laughs> just try and get out the back as quick as possible and get into the clearer water again. I surfed up on the north coast of Cornwall and the water looked pretty blue, looked pretty nice. Didn't think anything of it, but I got really ill afterwards for a couple of days. And I went to the doctors and they actually traced um, it back to some E. coli. It's pretty horrible. After the, the actual sickness had gone, I was still like a, a week after, like trying to get back to my feet. I think as surfers, we're sort of the first people that come across it because when we have these storms, we're the first ones in the water. We regularly check the Surfers Against Sewage app, Safer Seas app, just to get a good idea how much sewage is coming out, and it definitely does help, and I'd advise everyone else to do it. If I carted all of my waste down from home and came and tipped it on the beach, I'd get a massive fine, so why are they doing it? It's terrible. I feel angry too about raw sewage being discharged into our rivers. Why on earth is this happening? And what's it got to do with climate change? We have a historic network. The Victorians were brilliant at building sewage systems. World leaders in terms of sewage treatment and movement of sewage away from the city centres, but they were built in a way where they didn't separate surface water from the sewage itself. The climate is changing. Because we have what's called combined sewers, where we have water running off the roads into our sewage network, as well as sewage itself, when it really rains heavily, those systems get overwhelmed. There are certain places along our sewerage network that act as pressure valves. We plug little holes in it, and that allows that to go into the environment. If they weren't there, what you would find is the sewage would come up, probably through your toilet, into your house. So they're a necessity for, from a public health perspective. But sewers in Cornwall are overflowing into our rivers even when we haven't had a torrential downpour with nearly 14,000 incidents in 2020 alone. Climate change is only one part of the problem. Cornwall's population is almost twice the size it was in Victorian times, and it grows by 50% again with holidaymakers each summer. The antiquated sewer system is struggling to cope, so why not replace it? There are a number of things we can do that don't just uh, rely on us building bigger and bigger and bigger pipes. And there's a lot that customers can do in Cornwall to stop storm overflows. We treat in the region of 100,000 million litres of sewage every year. That's a lot of sewage. It's around about 9,000 kilometres of sewage pipe and network that we have in Cornwall. Most of it's underground. Most of it's in very difficult locations to get to. We have things called fatbergs. That's build up of oils and greases and things like wet wipes that can block a sewer up. The sewage can't get through, so it backs up and it finds its first way out, which could be a storm overflow. We remove tons and tons and tons of wet wipes from our system every year. They're not natural. They contain plastics. They don't degrade. If you actually put one in a bowl of water and leave it there for a year, it will still be there. If you put a piece of toilet paper in, it probably would have degraded in two or three hours. Pee, poo and paper, those are the three things that you should be putting down your toilet. You shouldn't be putting down sanitary products, plastics or anything else, because our sewage networks weren't designed to accept those things. What we flush down the loo clearly makes things worse, but with Southwest Water's parent company paying out a special shareholder dividend totaling of 1.5 billion, pounds last year, you'd think it could do a lot more to fix these spills. But while sewage hits the headlines, analysis shows that most of the nasty gut bacteria in Cornish rivers doesn't come from human waste at all. After 35 years working as a farm vet in Cornwall and West Devon, I've seen the impact that falling milk prices has made on farm incomes with many farmers trying to balance the book with bigger herds of cows, which are often kept indoors. The cow's waste is collected in huge pits, and when these are full, the slurry is sprayed onto the land as fertilizer. But with increasingly torrential rain and waterlogged earth, this often finds its way into our rivers. 
Meanwhile, fields they once grazed are now used to grow crops like maize to feed them. To hundreds of years ago, there wouldn't have been hardly any bare soil at all. You know, it would have all been grown over trees, moorland, wetland. Now, just the normal level of agriculture that we have does leave a lot of bare soil for a lot of the year. You know, big tractors, big trailers, big slurry spreading machines and intensive grazing. It's leading to much more poorer quality soils and also much more compacted soils. So any rain that does fall on the landscape is more quickly making its way to the river. So that means rivers are rising much more quickly and they're more likely to flood. But two days later, they're back down to where they started and all that water is gone. So once it stops raining, if you have a dry week, then all of a sudden you're looking at almost drought conditions. It takes hundreds of years to build a very small layer of topsoil. The rate at which it's being lost is way quicker than it's regenerating. When you delve underneath the surface a little bit, these gravels are actually smothered. So we do hear people sometimes talk about, you know, 60 harvests left, and that's just because every time it rains, we're losing tons and tons and tons of soil out of our rivers into the sea. The loss of our topsoil is causing a massive problem in estuaries, which are silting up more and more quickly. Foy has one of the deepest harbours in Europe, but the Harbour Authority has to spend around £100,000 each year on dredging the channel to keep it clear for huge ships picking up the china clay. Now some Cornish farmers are helping to find solutions. Anybody that's a farmer loves nature. We're only here for one generation. This is only my farm until I'm gone. So most farmers want to look after it and do a better job than what the predecessor did. With climate change, we've got to prepare for a heavy rain and fall. We've got to prepare for hot summers. And it's better to be proactive than reactive. We're in the bottom of four valleys and with a heavy rainfall, all the mud will run off the fields. So it's got to come down. And this is the lowest point of the farm before it gets to the river. Eight years ago, Alan dug out two large settlement ponds to trap this sediment washing off his land. A day's work at a cost of 500 pounds. Every summer, springtime, we'll dig the mud out. We take it to the fields, spread it and plow it back in. You've got the nutrient value of any dung or silage that may be in the residue, and you've got the topsoil going back onto the land. It was surprising, actually, when we first dug it out, we thought there'd be a little bit, but we're taking out between 15 and 20 tonnes per year. The water coming out through the other side, going into the river, is 100% cleaner. There's no silt, no mud, no pollution. It's just a good thing that works well. Not far away, fifth generation farmer Chris Giusto grows potatoes for pasties, fish and chip shops, and also Cornwall's only vodka and gin distillery. Instead of leaving his fields bare all winter, Chris has started planting a deep-rooted cover crop called Phacelia. So we started doing this in the last sort of two, three years because we seem to be getting some real heavy rainfall in a short space of time. Cornwall's quite steep, so the ground is more prone to soil runoff. If we're going to continue to grow potatoes in Cornwall, we're going to have to think more about putting in crops like this. When you've got a field like this, it's just fully green, just not bare at all. That will catch the water. We only get one lot of top, so once it's gone, it's gone. So if we're doing our bit and looking at ways of tilling less, burning less diesel, I think that is where the future is going. We're almost going back to the basics of what farmers used to do probably 50, 60, 70 years ago, so sort of my granddad's generation. Without soil, we can't do anything. So it's in our interest and for my kids, their future generations, to protect it and look after it as much as we can. Finding ways to hold water in the land so it can seep out slowly instead of rushing straight into our rivers is not just important for preserving topsoil. Because it's no longer being kept cool underground, the water in our rivers is heating up. Fish start to get stressed at around 18 degrees but last summer saw temperatures in some Cornish rivers rise to 22. And temperatures are rising in winter too, piling extra stress on our most famous freshwater fish, the once plentiful salmon. After years at sea, they returned to spawn in the Cornish rivers where they were born. Salmon populations have declined dramatically. We take more measurements here on the River Tamon than probably any other river in England or the UK. 
Here at the fish trap, we count every fish that comes into the river. We can also take measurements, fish size, body condition. We can take a few scales so that we can understand where these fish are feeding. We can look at damage, we can look at disease. We can learn a huge amount from these fish as they travel in and out of our freshwater system. So when the fish go out to sea, they travel north where they will feed ferociously before they return. Marine climate is changing, we know that, and their feed is moving ever further north. As those fish are returning, they are smaller and they have less body condition than we've ever seen before. When the salmon return, we need the water temperature to drop around to eight degrees or less. This is the trigger for salmon to spawn. If we don't get really cold autumns and early winters, then those fish will spawn less frequently. Our own data over the last 30 years has shown in an increase of about one degree in our rivers across Cornwall. Climate change isn't only a danger to fish, it's a danger to us as well. Warmer air holds more water and we're now getting 17% more rain on our wettest days than we were prior to the 1990s. Cornwall's steep-sided valleys, combined with the changes to our land use, have already caused some catastrophic floods in recent years, like Boss Castle and Coverack. But less dramatic events are happening all the time. Janet Lockyer has been on the receiving end. Her 400-year-old cottage was flooded twice, once in 2010 and again in 2012. It was half past five in the morning and I was up for work. It's pitch black that time in November. I couldn't see anything just something told me something wasn't right. And I woke my husband up. He went over with a torch. He stood at the bridge and looked at me and he said, you won't be going to work. We're in deep trouble. It just came up the path and just filled the house like a goldfish bowl. I just stood there watching it, thinking, this can't. I put towels down to begin with and then thought, why have I done that? Because by then it had filled the house. All we knew was we'd lost everything. We lived in a caravan on the drive for six months. The second time, that was worse because it happened to me again and I knew the outcome. And if I could have taken a pill, gone to sleep that night and never woken up, I would have done that because that's how I felt. It had beaten me. Janet's insurance paid out 80,000 pounds to put everything right. The house now has a sump and pump and the carpets have been replaced with slate floors in case it's flooded again. But she's worried about how unprepared most people are for events like this. I'd never had an, a reason to really worry about the river, but now I can be out there at three o'clock in the morning with a torch because I've got a great fear of waking up and coming down the stairs to water. Really, I am paranoid about that. I have to come down and check the river level before I can go back to sleep. This is just the start of it. It's going to get worse. And people need to understand that. Louisa Inch agrees. Luckily for her village, she's a flood prevention expert and she's helping it to become one of the first in Cornwall to develop an emergency plan. The Environment Agency said we've got to adapt or die when it comes to flood risk in Cornwall alone that there's about 28,000 properties that are at risk of flooding. Just because you are not near a river or you're near the sea, it doesn't mean that you are not at risk of flooding. You could easily flood on top of the hill. You can get flooded from the road, from the fields, from surface water, which comes down across the fields like absolute torrents. And if your property is at the bottom of one of those torrents, then you will get flooded. Normally these emergency plans are set out for all the, the larger either cities or towns and it basically gives a blueprint of how once we receive a flood warning how we're going to help those people and get them to safety. Communities have got to be more prepared and that's because there's intense pressure on the emergency services. If there's a major flood event in Cornwall they've only got a certain amount of people that can actually go out and save lives. Little villages like ourselves at Perrinwell Station, we would have to look after our village until help arrives, and that could be one or two days later after the event. Louise's worry is people don't realise what climate change is going to mean for their homes. Regulation changes coming in 2039 mean thousands of properties will be uninsurable 
unless they have safety systems installed to minimise the flood risk. At the moment, there's a scheme that's called Flood Re, and that's where you can get low-cost insurance in high flood risk areas. The closer we get to 2039, the harder it's going to be to be able to get that flood insurance. PFR products, which is Property Flood Resilience Products, gives you time to either escape the property or be able to actually control the water within, say, the first two or three metres behind the door, rather than the water just coming in one big gush. This pad alone will actually absorb up to 20 litres of water. This one here is a puddle pump, smart air bricks cable ducts where your gas and electric comes into the property so you can use this waterproof putty which will then create their waterproof barrier. Individuals think that it's not going to happen to them. We've all got to look at our risk of flooding. We've got to get away from the mindset that it's down to the council or the environment agency to actually put it right. Even without so many homes at risk of flooding, Cornwall is already facing a housing crisis. It has one of the highest house building targets in the whole country with over 50,000 homes due to be built over the next 10 years. This will mean concreting over huge areas of natural land which would otherwise help to absorb the extra rain falling due to climate change. Jackie Smith is a specialist in sustainable urban drainage systems known as SUDS. Her job is to ensure that developments include drainage designs that will prevent all this new construction from adding to Cornwall's flood risk. We've got an awful lot of house building, we've got an awful lot of extensions. We've got Langarth, which is an extension to Truro. Well, Langarth is a huge development. It's not just houses, there's a commercial area as well as the stadium for Cornwall. The aim of sustainable drainage systems is to try and capture the water and release it at a controlled rate so it's not just going whoosh straight the way down to affect people downstream. So traditional system, pipe systems, basically the water would go into a pipe. The aim would be to get the water away from that place as quickly as possible. The only difficulty with doing that is, of course, people could be flooded further downstream. What we're trying to do is to spread out the rainfall across an area rather than concentrating it into one place. This is an attenuation feature, so basically it collects the rainwater, it holds the water within the basin. This is a permeable surface, so it's a plastic grid to keep the stone in place. So when the rain falls on here, it's encouraged to actually go into the ground rather than run, run straight off. Drainage features like these could make a huge difference to flood risk and the pressure on our antique sewer network, but they can take up valuable space on a building plot one of the biggest challenges is getting property developers to include them because they're still not a legal requirement. Developers basically, once they've got the option on the site, they want to get on there and start building houses. Some developers are very good, some are not, and some will really push and say, no, we're doing that, and where are your powers? The favourite one is, where is your authority? It is very difficult for us to object to a designer or a developer. We find it very, very frustrating when we've not got the powers that we need. One thing all these new housing developments in Cornwall are going to need is clean water, and the process of getting drinking water to our homes takes a surprising amount of energy. Here at Upper Tamil Lakes, just outside of Bude, first of all, this water's got to get here. That's by nature. But when it gets to the water treatment work, we need to take out pesticide, metals, hydrocarbons, sediments. If you used a traditional method, you need to bring in chemicals. They may need to come from 500 miles away, 1,000 miles away. And then we need to pump it somewhere to store it so that when people need it, they can use it. When you turn your tap on, it is energy intensive. This hidden carbon footprint of treating our water is an eye-opener, especially when you consider how much is wasted flush down the toilet or lost to leaks. The other important thing to think about with climate change is the variability in the climate. The beast from the east that we had three years ago caused a significant issue. As the ground freezes, it expands, and when, when it thaws, it contracts, and because of that, our pipes can move, and as we may end up having fractures in our pipes. When it gets really wet, pipes can move up and down, and that can have another impact. We're using drones now. They look across the landscape and they use fantastic infrared technology that helps us identify where leaks are. And that's really important in those more remote locations that we have in Cornwall. Reducing leaks will have a big impact on energy usage. But now, in the first for the entire country, some residents of Cornwall are actually getting super low carbon footprint drinking water supplied by a pipeline. Running along the Tamar Bridge, 
from the Mayflower plant in Plymouth. Mayflower is a really exciting water treatment works. Yes, it's in Devon, but it's connected to the supply network in Cornwall. And it's basically pushing water through a very, very, very fine mesh, like a sieve, but even finer than a sieve. And by pushing that water through it, it takes out all of the impurities and you don't have to use the same amount of chemicals. You don't have to use the same amount of energy. Far from the hustle and bustle of Plymouth and the busy Tamar, energy is going into something very different. Bodmin Moor is home to a little known habitat that acts as an incredibly important natural sponge to tackle both flooding and climate change. Yeah, so this is peat and you can see it's darker down here than it is up here and that's, so that's the older peat down at the bottom. Peat is basically plant material that's decomposed over a very, very long time. It's 80% water, about 20% plant material. And in a properly functioning peatland, it takes about a millimetre a year for peat to form. So it's incredibly slow growing. So what's that, 10, 20, 30, 40? So it's about 400 years old. In the past, peat was a valuable resource for people. They used to come out here and cut the peat so that they could dry it and use it as a fuel to burn on the fires. A lot of these areas in the uplands where the peat is or was, it was seen as wasteland, wet, boggy wasteland. So in the past, we put in all these drainage ditches to try and dry it out so that we could improve it for grazing and looking to grow crops. So it's just this accumulation of things over the centuries that have meant that the peatland is just all drying out, eroding away. When a peatland is functioning properly, it's got this ability to hold the water up in the uplands for longer. Morag and her team are painstakingly blocking up the old drainage ditches to allow the peatlands to start working properly again. And it stores about 20 to 30% more water after we've done restoration. So if we can do peatland restoration across thousands of hectares, that would be a massive, massive water storage success story that we have. Morag's work is especially urgent because the UK is home to a large amount of the world's peat. Although peat covers only 3% of the Earth's surface, it stores more carbon than all of the world's forests. Not too far away, there's another team of natural flood defence experts at work, but these ones are furry and have orange teeth. They moved in after farmer Chris Jones decided he wanted to help protect his nearby village from flooding. Laddock flooded twice in 2012 and very nearly flooded twice again in 2013, and I thought that we should learn how to hold more water on our land. And we had a long visit here with someone from the Environment Agency, and we walked the length of our stream, which he had lots and lots of prescriptions, and I said, OK, have you got any budget to make this happen? And he said, no, there's no budget. I then just said, OK, well, can we get beavers to do it for nothing? I think they're the most fascinating animal I've ever come across. Their ability to shape headwaters, small streams, is just phenomenal. I mean, the things that they do, we can kind of do, instead of letting them do it, but it takes a huge amount of manpower and you can never do it as well. So they've just been doing some work here, pushing up all this mud. The dams are only partially sticks. They're mostly mud. Which they just keep pushing up, pushing up, pushing up all the time. So the dam wall eventually becomes like a living construction. And once it gets to be really, really greened up, they can just last for years and years. So this stream here, this is created by the beavers. This is water that's overflowing from the main pond and coming around completely separately down here. The pace of the water from there to there is slowed up just because it's got further to travel and it's going through a rougher kind of a environment. Because so much energy is taken out of the flow, all the silt and so on, it settles out pretty easily and you get a lot of that silt is associated with nitrates and phosphates. So you're cleaning up the river at the same time. The hard-working beavers' leaky dams have not just slowed down the volume and speed of water flowing off Chris's farm, they've had lots of other benefits too. If we think about the climate, we are told we are going to get more and worse floods, and lo and behold, we do get more and worse floods. But at the same time, we also get droughts, more and worse droughts. And you know, in 2018, we had water that we could pump out onto a pasture to help the grass grow 
which without this we couldn't have done. If every little river valley in Cornwall, and they're all surrounded by farms, you know, there's no real part of the county which is not farmed apart from the towns. If we had this reserve of water here, I believe it'd be wholly beneficial to the farming industry. The change in the landscape since the beavers arrived in 2017 has been extraordinary, with dozens of felled trees and the water flowing across a much wider area through many tiny rivulets and channels. Until beavers were exterminated in the UK hundreds of years ago, this is what every watercourse in the country would have looked like. Everything they do has an impact, like the same thing, everything we do has an impact. And you might think, oh, it's an ecological disaster knocking over those trees. And actually what it's doing, it's laying more light in, so more stuff can happen. A lot of the stumps uh, are alive. We've just had a study done on that, and 70% plus of the cut stumps actually regenerate their coppice. The reason we've lost so much wildlife is because we've knackered up food sources mostly through farming, through pesticides and herbicides, but also through the destruction of ponds and making our rivers less natural. At relatively small cost to the agricultural economy, we could really flip this thing around. And these streams, they are just ready-made nature recovery networks. This is a postage stamp. Imagine if we had this spread out, instead of, instead of 200 metres, 2,000 kilometres in Cornwall. Wouldn't that be amazing? Our beautiful fresh waterways in Cornwall face a lot of threats, many more than I'd ever realised. If we keep letting our soil wash away, how are we going to keep ourselves safe from flooding, store water for droughts, or even grow our food? If we're clever, we can make things so much better and save money on our water bills by restoring nature and letting water behave in a more natural way. So it's been great to get some glimpses of this already starting to happen. Because even if you aren't as lucky as me and you have never seen a live salmon, a beaver or even a kingfisher. We all depend on these waterways just as much as these animals do. Next time you turn on the tap or flush the loo, think about the carbon footprint of that water and where it started, far away in one of Cornwall's rivers or streams. When you have a water meter, you use 15% less water. You can also work out whether or not you've got any leaks on your property. Definitely, if you're buying compost, you look for those peat-free labels. We continue to dig down and take that peat away to be put in compost, just destroying that habitat. Get a water butt. Why use water that's been treated so when you can get water free from the sky? We've all got to look at our risk of flooding, which we can do online. There's free maps online, and we've got to take responsibility. What you put down your loo, pee, poo and paper, but we can't treat plastics. Please get involved. A lot of the streams are still not being monitored. You are actually doing something really useful, and it's good fun. I don't want to make a fuss, but if you dig anything